Back with you on Hitting Hard with John Chuckery here on Locked On Sports Atlanta. Don't forget, we're asking you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Go to Locked On Sports ATL. You'll uh, see this there on Twitter as well. Check us out on YouTube. Don't forget to give me a follow on my Twitter page at JMCH316. I want to tell you about my friends over at Built Bar. Of course, we've been talking about these folks that, look, I know you probably had some New Year's resolutions and you had some high hopes and things like that. Maybe you've slipped back a little bit. Let me get you back on track, okay? If you go to Built.com, you can check out the whole line of protein bars that they have there. Plus, have you tried the puffs yet? We've been talking about how good these things are. The first protein-infused marshmallow is available at Built.com. So they've got all the flavors that you want to try, the yummy cinnamony churro, coconut marshmallow, banana cream pie, all the different flavors on the puffs. And remember, all the puffs are 100% milk chocolate coated. And so you want that high protein, but you want that sort of sweet tooth fix on all of that. You're talking about 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, four net carbs, 17 grams of protein though. So if you're looking for an alternative, you have to cure that sweet tooth. The puffs are going to be the way to go. And also if you go to built.com, take a look at all the line of protein and nutrition bars that they have. Mint brownie, coconut, coconut almond. New for this month, the white chocolate cookies and cream is available to you. They're always going to be coming out with all new kinds of flavors. So keep up to date at built.com with all of the different flavors going on. And just for you listeners out there and video watchers, I guess, uh, too, if you go to built.com today, use the promo code LOCKED15, L-O-C-K-E-D-1-5, LOCKED15, and you'll get 15% off of your order. 15% off your order at built.com if you use the program uh, promo code, excuse me, LOCKED15. Use that for 15% off at built.com. You'll be glad that you did. All right, as we are literally two weeks and a day away from the NFL draft, two weeks from tomorrow is when the draft starts out there. You know, I still believe that the Falcons have to prioritize defensive end, edge rusher, however you want to label that uh, type of position in today's NFL world, outside linebacker, whatever you want to call that person. You know, when, when the first round of sort of prospecting guys and looking at senior bowl and guys coming out and everybody who announced and things like that. One of the guys that intrigued me greatly that we knew was going to come out was David Ajabo, who is the outside linebacker for Michigan. Now, the last time we saw Ajabo, well, the last time we saw him play was in the national semifinal game against the Georgia Bulldogs. And obviously he was part of that Michigan team that made the playoffs. Um, they got smacked around by, you know, the national champion. I don't think there's really any harm in, in all of that, but Ajabo and Hutchinson were one of the biggest wrecking crews in all of college football as far as defensive ends go, outside linebackers, whatever you want to call those guys. Uh, what, 25 sacks between the two of them? They were really a two-man wrecking crew for that Michigan defense. Then we fast forward to the pro day for David Ojabo because he was not at the Senior Bowl, obviously. And Ojabo goes down with you know an ACL injury, and he's going to be out for a while. You know, when the Falcons were, you know, first looking and, and I'm first doing some analysis on the draft, I very much would have been very high on the Falcons taking Ojabo at number eight. I think that he is a player that while raw and he doesn't have as much experience as some guys, it's two things. One is his upside. He may upside higher than what Adrian Hutchinson is even going to do at Michigan, but Ojabo's done one thing in college. He goes and goes and gets the quarterback and sacks the quarterback and puts him on the ground. It's not a move him off the spot. It's not a, you know, make him flustered. It's not a this, that, that. It's get up the field. He gets the quarterback wrapped up and he puts him on the ground. Well, guess what the number one skill set that the Falcons can't do? That would be, I don't know. Let's think about this for a second. Mm -hmm. It would be get up the field, wrap the quarterback up and put them to the ground. So they need desperately anybody who can help them do that. I loved Ojabo even at eight, but now with the injury and you look at where the Falcons pick number 43 in the second round, if Ojabo's there, I'd very much love for the Falcons to go get him. Now, realistically, here's what you're probably looking at. Okay. Number one is at best, he's coming back for the second half of the season. So he's probably going to miss at least six to eight months in, in his rehab recovery, things like that. All right. He's also very raw and he needs to be coached. Yeah, you know, he literally only had 620 snaps in college and only played, I think it was 20 games. But we've seen the Falcons do this literally with another Michigan player last year, right? They spent a third round pick on Jalen Mayfield, who had 13 starts in college. 
who was a raw prospect and they think had a lot of upside, but you know, they still have a lot of work to go and he needs to be coached up. Well, I do trust the idea of Dean Pease. If he gets his hands on a guy can coach a guy up and with Ojabo being hurt and he can kind of slow work himself back in who, I mean, for all due respect for the Falcons, who cares if he plays this year? Honestly, y'all, y'all have told me that they're tanking and they're going to be bad and, and it doesn't matter. And this year doesn't count. Okay. Then you can afford to go get yourself a project that you can groom and develop and get ready. And I do think at some point Ojaba will play this season. I do think that he's going to get himself back on the field. But what difference does it make whenever he does? Honestly, like what what difference does it make if Ojabo comes back middle of the season, the last quarter of the season, whatever? I want to see the Falcons develop a guy and legitimately develop a guy who can get the quarterback down on the ground. So if you told me that the Falcons, and I know this is probably a crazy scenario to think about the Falcons, given the way that they draft or what we've seen on this regime. If you told me they could get Jermaine Johnson at number eight, and then they could go get David Ajabo at, say, 43. I don't know if he lasts till 58. I've seen all kinds of mock projections for Ajabo. I've seen him where he's still a first-round pick. I've seen him where he's still not even just at the bottom of the first round, but still in the 20s in the first round. And I've seen him mocked in the second. And I've seen him heck mocked toward the third round. We don't know. Like all these nudniks that do all their mocks and all this kind of stuff, they don't have any information. I mean, don't don't buy in or believe what these you know ninny hammers and you know, nitwit nudniks and all that kind of stuff have out there. They they don't have any information about the way that NFL teams actually look at these types of players. But you would have to figure that a guy who suffered an injury where at best you're going to get maybe a half a season out of him in his rookie year probably make some of the teams that are trying to win now, you know, leery of grabbing a guy like that, knowing that he's going to miss time with the Falcons. It doesn't matter. Falcons are not on a one year timetable. They're not trying to win now. They're not going to be good this year, right? I'm going off all the things that y'all told me about, you know, as far as, you know, what the season is going to be and not be and things like that. So I would be very, very happy if at 43, you told me the Falcons would go take David Ajabo. I can live with him being a prospect or project, excuse me. I can live with his limited snaps. I can live with his injury and things like that. What I would love to do is I said, get him in here, get him rehabbed and get him under the tutelage of Dean Pease. Say what you want about Dean Pease, but their defense definitely hung in. Considering that they can't sack the quarterback at all, um, which, you know, in the NFL, if you can't sack the quarterback, you know, you might as well be playing with one arm tied behind your back. But considering that they played without being able to sack the quarterback, their defense really hung in there. Their defense was able to hang in and fight and scratch and claw. Yeah, there were some weeks like the Cowboys where, you know, they got blown out and their defense got ran all over the field and all this, that, and the other. But, you know, look, defensively, I think they did a good job of hanging in there against some of those teams. And now is the time where if you're going to talk about prospects and guys that have lots of upside, but are raw and need some work, this is the time when you draft these guys. Not when you're good and you're ready to start making a run at the playoffs and this, that, and the other. You need guys to come in and make an immediate impact. And again, I'm not talking about drafting him at number eight, you know, although, like I said, had he not have gotten hurt, I would have been very intrigued with the idea of, of drafting him there. But boy, if you could, if you could get him in the second round and you can have a prospect like that whose job was to just go wreak havoc on quarterbacks, I don't think you can go wrong. And and if he was there at 58, that would be even more intriguing because I still believe in the idea of if you trade, let's let's just say if you trade back in the draft or if you trade Grady Jarrett or whatever like that, I'm still of the mindset of trying to put some kind of bundle of picks together to get yourself back up into the first round so that you can go grab yourself a quarterback. But boy, I'd have to take a long look at having a Jabo on, you know, on, on my board for when the Hawks or sorry, when the Falcons pick in the second round. And there's no such thing for this team right now as drafting too many edge players. I, I would much rather sacrifice 
not drafting a wide receiver, not drafting a safety, not drafting another corner. If I could load up on more edge players, you're not going to draft enough of those guys because you got to roll the dice and you got to find as many guys who can come in and help you as they can. And Ojaba wouldn't have to come in here with any pressure to start or anything like that. Even in the second half of the season, you work him in, you get him acclimated, you get him coached up and things like that. And who knows, maybe you have a prospect that turns out to be an elite type of talent. All right. When we come back on hitting hard, um, Dan Snyder, you going to tell me that he's the only guy doing all these crazy things? We're going to discuss all of that next. It's sort of a what's bugging Chuckery. John Chuckery here. It's hitting hard with John Chuckery on Locked On Sports Atlanta.